Hey, it's just I uh, want to welcome everybody uh, to this. It's supposed to be fireside chat in the, in the middle of a very hot day here, and I'm in upstate New York. And and Dawn, this is kind of exciting because you're in China, and you actually planned on being back in the U.S. and have got caught up in the coronavirus travel restrictions, right? Yes, my flight uh, was canceled, and actually has been canceled several times now. Each time it was postponed a little bit. Um, but so right, I was right, planning to be back uh, by now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anyway. So right. yeah. So let's get started. <laughs> um, right. So yeah. So Ali, you have a very interesting background. Could you first talk a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Um, I am a physician by way of background, and I have a dual board certification, so medically recognized subspecialty in primary care and in clinical informatics. And I, I tell people that means that I'm bilingual, that I speak clinical and I speak technology. So you'll hear me go back and forth between both. And I'm a, as part of that informatics board certification, and we also deal with policy and regulation around health IT as well. And I've yeah, been working great. in emerging technology, my whole emerging technology, my whole career, uh, all the way from paper-based records to where we are today with blockchain. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. It's great to, you know, to have you here. Uh, it's uh, such a unique and rare, uh, you know, this mix up. Right. And then I look at, I look at you and you're like, you're a computer scientist as well. So you're speaking that technical. And then you have this interest in healthcare uh, it, it, through Oasis Labs. So part of me was like, oh, is Oasis Labs just healthcare or you do more than healthcare at Oasis Labs? Yeah, yeah, so I'm uh, happy to talk a little bit about myself and my background as well. Um, I'm a professor at UC Berkeley in computer science, and also I'm the founder and CEO uh, of a startup called Oasis Labs. And at Oasis Labs, we are building what we call a platform for a responsible data economy, essentially enables uh, data to be utilized in a more uh, responsible and privacy-preserving way. And given mm -hmm. that uh, when we talk about data and uh, uh, privacy for data, of course, uh, medical data is some of the most uh, privacy sensitive data. And sure. hence, healthcare is a very, uh, it's particularly a very good uh, use case and application domain for this type of technology. And also, you know, how important data is for healthcare. And hence, uh, for Oasis Labs, as we build up this platform for a responsible data economy, Healthcare is the first application domain uh, that we have been exploring and with some successful use cases. And of course, the technology that we develop is general, it's not just uh, specific for healthcare. And in fact, we have been exploring uh, use cases in other application domains as well, including financial okay. uh, areas, uh, ad tech, uh, and other, for example, uh, IoT space uh, as well. Right, right. So because healthcare has this very specific, as you said, very useful data impacts so many people's lives, especially if we can share it. And we have to be so sensitive to keeping it private as well. And so we'll get questions say, well, is there a trade off? Is there a point of exposing people's data, the trade off for public good? And, and so we get asked about that trade off. And I know at Ernst & Young, we, we kind of went in with Consensus Health and uh, Microsoft, and we release protocols that are privacy preserving. And it's not just for healthcare, but other business transactions or smart contracts you want to keep private. But we release, release a baseline protocol into the public domain so you don't have to have that trade off, that you can have responsible sharing of data and still preserve privacy right, using the Ethereum mainnet, so using zero knowledge proofs. Uh, how does Oasis approach privacy and transparency? I think we're in agreement on the trade-off, or, or do you feel there needs to be a trade-off? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. That's essentially what we are working towards. That's what we are striving for, mm -hmm. is that we can enable privacy-preserving usage of data uh, and this responsible use of data, and also at the same time, still enable the transparency, enable actually users to know how their data has been utilized and, and so on. And at Oasis in particular, 
what we focus on is actually application use cases that's much, much broader than, for example, what Ethereum uh, enables. So for example, the kind of uh, uh, privacy preserving usage that you talk about on Ethereum using zero knowledge proofs, they are more focused on privacy preserving financial transactions. So it's just about, you know, uh, transferring money, for example, from one person to another, and you want to protect uh, the privacy for that transaction. But however, when we talk about, for example, healthcare and many other application domains, then it's what we need is actually much more than just uh, financial transactions. We actually need to be able to enable data to be utilized, for example, uh, doing data analysis, training machine learning models on the data, for example, on medical data to, to try to detect um, right, disease early on to provide better cures for diseases. And in these cases, uh, also we want to ensure that we protect users' privacy and also at the same time to still enable data to be utilized for these important right. goals and purposes. And that's really what right. uh, you know, the platform for a responsible data economy that at OASIS that we are building um, to, towards to try to address these challenges. And in particular, mm -hmm. with our platform, we enable uh, users to maintain control of their data uh, uh, and uh, uh, to specify also how they want their data to be utilized. Data is stored in an encrypted form. And when data is being used, the data actually, the computation of the data happens in what we call a secure uh, computing environment. Uh, and also uh, through uh, various different privacy technologies, we ensure that the usage of the data can, uh, can be uh, uh, compliant to users' policies for how they want their data to be utilized. And also we ensure that the usage of the data is being logged and it's um, putting into the immutable uh, log uh, in the blockchain ledger and so on. So all together by combining blockchain and privacy technologies, we enable users to maintain control and their data rights right. uh, to the data and also at the same time to enable data to be utilized in a privacy preserving way. And so ideally achieving so both privacy and this transparency at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when you think about data rights, uh, I know, uh, the, again, the way we've approached it, mud it for data rights, and when it comes to healthcare, we've put the patient at the center, and we've said everything mm -hmm. needs to start with everything needs to start with patient consent. And right now, we feel that, and it's patient data sharing consent. I should be specific: not consent for procedure or consent to participate in a study, but data sharing consent. Uh, generally, right now, it's difficult and opaque to see how our data is shared. Once I agree to share data for one reason, I have no control over whether it's shared for another reason, de-identified, used, et cetera, it, it, people grab it. So we put the patient at the center, and we think blockchain is very useful for that, for sharing how you want to share consent, track who you've shared and given consent to, for what data and for what purpose. Uh, without exposing. Uh, how do you, in a way, sometimes deal with data rights and who do you look, say, who who owns the data and, and what rights do they have? <laughs> right, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, this is a very good question and you've made a very good point. So, so in particular here, we view, that's why we want to combine, in particular, marry blockchain and privacy and secure computing technologies together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's exactly to enable uh, capabilities and uh, features like this. So, so for example, the blockchain can be used to provide the immutable log for users' uh, data rights uh, and the policies of how they want their data to be utilized. And then, mm -hmm. so essentially, for example, the blockchain, you can use that to record uh, patients' consent and so on. But then still, you, like he, what you just mentioned, so today, you, uh, users, uh, patients, they don't really know, actually, uh, once they can sense what their data is uh, used for, how their data has been used, who is using their data, and so on. Because right now, all that actually happens outside of the system in some sense. The, the patients don't have a way to know. Um, so, so that's why when we combine the blockchain, uh, the ledger, with actually a secure computing environment, then in this case, every time when the data is being used, we actually know uh, we can actually have an immutable log 
uh, of that usage of the data into the blockchain uh, and also uh, with this secure computing environment, uh, we can ensure that when the data is being used, uh, the data that isn't just copied out uh, into some okay. you know, outside of the system because once the data is copied out, then you can never know what happens to the data. Um, by right. combining the, the blockchain ledger and the secure computing environments, we ensure that the, the data essentially uh, will stay inside the secure uh, computing environment as it's being used. And also right. uh, we have various ways to ensure uh, that we can check that the usage of the data is compliant with the policy. And also in this case, you can know who is using, using your data and you can have a log, uh, you know, the computation that has been done on the data and all this together then can really actually for the first time to ensure that the users can actually know what has happened to their data and to ensure that the data actually is uh, actually, you know, satisfies uh, its policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so that's why Great. it's so, uh, really so important to marry the two. And we actually call this the blockchain 3.0 because I think for blockchain, you know, 1.0 is more like a Bitcoin and three, the blockchain 2.0 is like Ethereum that they add some of the smart contract capabilities, but, uh, but we feel that uh, still, uh, actually, it's really important to have this strong marriage of blockchain and secure compute. So, so we call this actually blockchain 3.0 to really enable this right. new capability that couldn't be you know, sure. enabled. Yeah, and, and more frequently, I, I frequently get asked questions about HIPAA and where, where data is moving and and HIPAA, and I, I have to remind people that it's very specific. HIPAA is very specific to entities that bill Medicare uh, electronically or the business associates that support that. And HIPAA has its own requirements, as you, you say, for a secure computing environment uh, that these covered entities yes. are required to maintain data in those uh, secure environments. So have you also looked at maybe help me understand is the OASIS model one we we like where we send, we leave the data there. The data never moves there. We really send the algorithms and the insights is what moves on blockchain, not the data itself. Is that similar to what Oasis is doing? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. So, so, uh, so for the Oasis platform, what's on the blockchain really, as I mentioned, these are logs, of immutable logs of users rights mm -hmm. to data and their policies right. of how they want their data to be utilized and also logs of how the data has been used. So every time the data mm -hmm. is used, uh, there will be logs uh, of uh, the usage of the data, uh, what competition, what type of, uh, essentially the, the kind of competition that has been mm -hmm. done on the data and so on. So really the ledger is a log of the various aspects of the data, but the data itself is never really stored on the ledger itself. Also, as you can imagine with healthcare data and so on, like there's so much data. So it doesn't really make sense to also to store the data itself on the, on the ledger. But what we do is that again, we have the secure uh, computing environment and also secure storage environments where the data uh, is in. And also in certain cases, the data really uh, can be it's stored in a distributed form. Uh, in certain cases, either the patients or the hospitals, they can maintain their own storage and we just right. ensure that uh, we have ways, so the data, of course, is stored in encrypted form, and we can check its integrity as well. And, and the important part is just when the data is used, it can only be used in the secure uh, computing and secure execution environment. So, and, and how does this translate into data marketplaces? Right now we have the data sitting in these secure environments and healthcare settings, but can you talk a little about data marketplaces and healthcare and what you see? The future is for that? Yeah. Right, right, that's a really good question. And also in particular, the technology for uh, the way building at the Oasis Labs uh, for a responsible data economy, I think can really enable a new, I will say a new era for data marketplaces. So as we know, yeah. data is a key driver of modern economy. Uh, essentially, especially, you know, going to the future, all the important decisions, they will all be data driven and so on. And so data is really, really important. And it's, uh, as we know, it's a huge, uh, hugely valuable. And so today uh, there is nascent you know, data marketplaces. Uh, but however, today's data marketplace 
uh, the issue is in general they sell raw data and uh, so the, the the buyer once the buyer buys the data the buyer buys raw data and then once the buyer buys the raw data the buyer essentially can do anything it wants with the data and hence this can have a huge privacy uh, challenges uh, and risks and so so I think also this is part of the reason why the data marketplace today is very in its very nascent form like there are many many of these uh, concerns and considerations so but in the future we want to enable data to really be more widely used so another uh, issue today is the data silos a lot of valuable data because they are sensitive they cannot be very well uh, utilized they stay uh, locked up uh, in these data silos so for you know either the government or businesses or individuals, if they can actually uh, be able to use this data, then it can help them make much better decisions and, and so on. Right. So with this- Do you have an example? Do you have, do you have an example of how Oasis Labs is applying this in healthcare? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yes, I can give you an example of uh, the, in the genomic use case uh, in a second. So, so essentially, then with this technology, we can enable a new type of uh, data economy that we call responsible data economy. So, so in, this, uh, in this setting, for example, when we talk about data marketplace, it's no longer that the buyer buys uh, you know, raw data uh, from the seller. Uh, in this case, uh, in this new paradigm, the buyer can buy uh, essentially a certain type of usage of the data, for example, uh, if you want to compute some statistics, let's say in healthcare, you want to uh, compute some statistics uh, and, and, or you want to train a model uh, over some data, then you can do that. And right. then in this way, it can protect the user's privacy and, uh, and also still enable this type of, like either it's medical research, or it's the government uh, needs to have better, uh, right, uh, better statistics of uh, uh, what's happening. So, so we can enable this type of uh, use cases while still protecting users' privacy because then the, the buyer in this case, they buy the usage of the data and they won't get the raw data so that they uh, essentially users' privacy and also their rights to data will be uh, still protected. So one okay. uh, concrete example uh, use case uh, that we are actually in the process of launching a product on is in the genomic uh, uh, use case. So you may be familiar with, uh, for example, 23andMe. Uh, uh, so 23andMe and Ancestry. So these type of companies, they provide genomic analysis to, uh, to users. Um, but both actually uh, 23andMe and, Gen and Ancestry uh, recently have, uh, have gone through, even before COVID, uh, they have gone through some layoffs, citing slowdown, um, adoption, uh, due to in particular privacy concerns. So actually many friends of mine have, uh, uh, have told me about uh, their, their concerns about their genomic data as gets into hands of others and they, you know, it, it's really privacy sensitive. So, so what we are doing here by in, uh, it, with this uh, responsible data economy technology is that, so in this case, when we launch, actually it will be the first time where users can become owners of their genomic data. So the data uses genomic data is stored in encrypted form and the users have control of how the data will be used. They can specify how the data can be used. So for example, we are doing this in partnership with another genomic company. So the user can give consent for the genomic company to run genomic analysis on their data, uh, but nothing else. So then in this case, uh, we, our platform enables the genomic company to run their genomic analysis in the secure uh, computing environment uh, so that they can provide a service, can provide the genomic analysis results to the users, but uh, they never have raw access to the data. So then in this case, so, they can so go who gets, and sell who gets data, paid? Sell you data. So, <clears throat> So a, com a company pays a company pays for the genomic data. Uh, the patient's given consent. Does the patient get some of that money? So then, uh, in that model, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's that's a uh, that's a very good question. So so in this case, actually, so one 
the user pays to get the genomic analysis results from the company. So in this case, right. the user right. pays. But in other cases, sure. for example, a pharmaceutical company wants to uh, use users' data to do some analysis uh, for developing better drugs and so on. So then in this case, the pharmaceutical company actually can pay, can pay to the users for their access to the data. And then the blockchain actually also tracks uh, that's how uh, the pharmaceutical company uses the data, whose data it has used, and then can help actually distribute the value created from that as well. So this is another great you know, marriage between the blockchain technology and the privacy technology to enable uh, this type of uh, uh, use cases. Sure. Well, we got some requests to talk about given the COVID crisis and the COVID crisis right now, what, what role can blockchain play in, in the COVID crisis? And we have certainly yeah. looked at uh, con contact tracing and the concerns that people have with privacy in contact tracing. Now, we've, we've taken a, uh, we're not using blockchain for contact tracing uh, at this point. Uh, has a waste, how has Oasis Labs approached it? I see, I see. Uh, right, so at Oasis Labs, we also build uh, different privacy technologies. So, so in this particular case, we actually have a project in collaboration uh, with the researchers from UC Berkeley and also uh, NUS in Singapore, uh, developing new privacy technologies to enable uh, privacy preserving contact tracing. For example, we actually have an extension to the Google Apple exposure notification uh, protocol. Uh, to mm -hmm. actually add uh, more privacy uh, protection uh, so that so we can ensure that uh, in that case, users can just learn whether they have been in close contacts with someone uh, who have been diagnosed uh, uh, with mm -hmm. COVID-19 without actually revealing any other uh, information either by the users or, or the, uh, the other person who actually has uh, contracted uh, COVID-19. So, so there are many- And, and, and what, if they, what if they don't want their information tracked? What if they don't want their, their phone or, or, or Google, Apple to be tracking them? Uh, how, do they, how, does a person, how does a person control that? Um, right. Do they have control so, over that? Or is, or is it yes. just we anonymize it uh, somewhere along the line, someone could figure out who you are, but do they, can they actually yeah. control it? Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, so in this particular in this particular case, our protocol called the EPONI um, actually ensures that uh, users are not being tracked. You, the only thing that the user will learn is whether you have been in close contact with someone who has been diagnosed uh, with uh, uh, with COVID nineteen, um, but not uh, not anything else. And so, this is another example you talked about. Uh, you know. Uh, the trade-offs is another great example showing that here we don't need to trade off. We can have great privacy and also at the same time enable users mm -hmm. to learn the information that uh, the user needs to learn. And also just as a brief note, uh, since you mentioned about this COVID-19 and, and the contact tracing and uh, the trade-off with privacy and so on. So we actually are uh, uh, launching another event uh, called the Responsible Data uh, Summit. Uh, and okay. one of the tracks is actually on what we call responsible data in the time of a pandemic, uh, exactly mm -hmm. uh, talking about this, uh, this topic. And we have a great list of speakers, uh, and that will be on Ju uh, July 14, and uh, the live event is on July 28th, uh, just responsibledata.ai. Okay. So, uh, so we, can also and we can talk about... COVID in, in, uh, in that context as well, right? Right, 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 exactly. Right. And also you have been asking me uh, a lot of great questions. I also want to take a little bit of time to, to ask you uh, some questions about your work, especially given sure. your unique uh, background uh, of this mm -hmm. great mix uh, between both uh, you know, healthcare and also computing technologies. Uh, so I think right. your views will be really helpful for the audience as well. So in particular, uh, talking about COVID-19, uh, right? Sure. So essentially, uh, right, moving to these more urgent issues, 
And uh, so again, COVID-19 has brought a number of questions regarding the importance of user privacy versus transparent data mm -hmm. to the forefront. Mm -hmm. So I also wanted to, right. I think it'll be great for you to share a little bit what you think are the trade-offs and also what role does hip hop play uh, in this. I've right. heard there has been um, you know, some discussions about maybe actually in certain cases, the hip hop is, uh, the HIPAA laws, uh, the HIPAA rules are even, our uh, requirements are even being relaxed. Sure, I, you know, I, I, as again, I, I tell people with HIPAA, you, you have to understand, uh, HIPAA is about protecting and making sure your data is shared the way you want it shared. If I decide to share my data, right, as a person decides to, I can put it on a billboard if I, if I want to. I can say, these are my COVID results. That, we have to understand, HIPAA doesn't prevent uh, me sharing my data with someone else and letting them use it the way I see fit. That, that's, that's really what uh, it's about. And so we do caution though, if you come out of a healthcare setting, if you use another entity, they might be covered under consumer privacy laws. So again, any, any use case we look at or business issue, I'm looking at the regulations, whether it be HIPAA, whether it be a state privacy consumer law and how the data is moving. That said, anything in healthcare, we start with patient consent and then patient consent and what we ultimately, an end user who wants to use their data, I said it, it, to your point, I'm not sure it's the, the raw data they need about COVID. Do you need my raw data about, about me and COVID? No, you need the insights from that and how you're gonna combine it with other information to allow people to safely return to work, to safely travel, to safely interact in public or with their family members. And so we still have so much to learn about COVID. So I look and say for blockchain right now, where it's gonna be most useful in our fight against COVID is going to be sharing data about COVID in a way that's trusted and transparent more for population than for individuals, right? So that we can act on large data sets and return that back and forth and everyone can agree and trust it because right now there's so much debate coming out and recommendations coming out on a daily basis that seems to be changing from organizations. So we need a way for all these organizations to share and trust the data. And I think that'll be the first step in going a long way towards helping to fight COVID. Uh, the second place where it can come in has less to do with the disease and more to do about the supply chain. And blockchain, there's not a better place, uh, a use case in healthcare and the operations side of the house for supply chain of where we're moving things. And I think this will become extremely important when we talk about and hopeful, very hopeful, everyone's very hopeful that there's gonna be vaccines uh, available for COVID. And so how we responsibly distribute that in a way, again, that's transparent and equitable. So some good uh, use cases ahead for COVID. I think we're almost out of, almost out of time here, were there any last burning questions or any wrap up uh, you wanted to give before we have to say goodbye to everybody? Uh, maybe just one more question. Uh, given your okay. experience in the domain, uh, can you talk about like what are your biggest concerns and uh, challenges that you see in the space, uh, and uh, the, in particular the challenges that technologies you think can help address in this space in what you just talked about? So um, I think the, the challenge is, I mean, again, in emerging technology my whole career, and I, I think that challenges are always less about the technology than about the business value and the people who are interested in using it or resistant to using it. And so we have to spend quite a bit of time assuring that the business issue people are trying to solve that blockchain is the way to go. I don't come in and sell blockchain. I come in and talk about business issues and, and, and where we find the good fit and we move forward. But we have to spend a lot of time up front on business value and aligning uh, what, what people see across an ecosystem because what's valuable to one person in the ecosystem or one organization, the other member of the ecosystem will have a different value. And so how we align value across an ecosystem those things are more important, those discussions almost than the technology itself. So yeah, great, great, great question. Great question. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. point. You know, as technologists, oftentimes we particularly mainly minute, focus on technology, minute, yeah. but it's so important to remind, to remember that, uh, right, so we need to make sure that uh, the, 
the business the business models work and people are incentivized right. to utilize these technologies. Yeah, yeah, the value make value yeah. has to make sense, or you or you won't be able to move right. forward. Yeah. So we we yeah. I, I spend I spend I spend more time on that, and then working with great technologists. Once we we say, hey, we really feel like we have good business value here. Now let's let's work with a technologist yeah. together to design to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, it's been a great good. conversation. Really, yes, really, yeah. really nice. Thanks, Dawn. Yeah, great talking together. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.